So with that, uh, we are going to start this session. Um, again, my name is Dan Reinhardt. I am part of the uh, Illinois team here at Edmentum. I'm going to be moderating uh, today's um, or this session, evidence-based practice to support special education students. Uh, so thank you for, for joining us. Um, before I hand it over to Megan, just a, a real quick um, housekeeping item. If you have questions, uh, we can uh, either field those as we go or save them to the end. Megan, do you have a preference on that? I don't have a preference. I did build, um, build in a few reflection times, um, which also might be a good time to ask questions as well. Yeah, awesome. So use the, please use the, the, the chat function to, to send over questions and I will um, uh, monitor that and uh, we'll, um, we'll have some time to answer questions. And this session will be recorded and shared out following, um, uh, following the conclusion of uh, all the events today. So know that that will be sent out if you have to jump off early. And with that, um, I would like to hand it over to Megan and we'll, We'll jump in. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Great. So welcome everybody to what we know works. Evidence-based practices to support special education students. Today we're going to cover some evidence-based practices and explore how these can be applied in the classroom live, also in distance learning environments. So thanks again for being here. I see a lot of familiar faces, so that's awesome. Thank you for all my colleagues who are here today and um, new faces as well. My name, like I said, is Megan White. I'm a special education teacher and instructional coach. I currently work in Harvard School District CUSD 50. This is actually my first virtual conference. So I'm gonna be honest and tell you there's been some anxiety and nerves around this. I like to kind of be able to walk around and feed off the audience. Um, but this seems to be the way that uh, we're communicating and learning these days. So I'm going to push myself out of my comfort zone here. And I appreciate you all for being here. I am toggling between two computers, so if it seems disjointed, um, that's why. Um, you see there my email address and Twitter account, along with a link to today's slides. But like um, Jason had mentioned, there's also going to be a shared folder for all the presentations today. If you have any issue accessing these, please just shoot me an email. I do have a lot to cover. I have a lot of slides, and that's just because this is such a passion of mine. So if you find me talking fast and, and moving too quickly, I apologize, please just let me know. Um, I'm hoping to get through everything today and still allow some, you know, for reflection times throughout and some time for question and answer as well. Um, so like I said, if I don't get to all those slides, please don't hesitate to email me. Okay. So a big thank you to Edmentum for putting this all together today. And thank you, Dan, to our, our moderator for being here. Remember, there are some giveaways for interactions. So be sure to tweet those, those out to Edmentum, Illinois. Um, I also wanted to be sure to give credit to Easter Seals for supporting the Illinois Autism Partnership. As you're going to see in, a, in the next slide, I've spent the last few summers working as a site coach for the Illinois Autism Partnership. And so a lot of what I share with you today are strategies and evidence-based practices that I've learned or explored further as a result of my time with this program, along with, of course, time in the classroom. And um, I've been blessed to work with so many wonderful teachers, um, administrators, coordinators. So a lot of different experiences have been put into this presentation. You might be hearing the word autism and thinking that today's strategies and practices won't apply. And, and I want to be sure to to, um, to point out that that's not necessarily true. It's my experience that these are just good teaching practices and that all learners can benefit from what we're going to cover today. And I, I hope you'll see that as we continue to explore. So just a little bit about me. Um, I know most of our audience members are in the Illinois area. So maybe, you know, we've even crossed paths along the way. I graduated high school from Downers Grove South, spent my college years at Illinois State University, um, started teaching. My first teaching gig was in Elmhurst School District. I did take a brief year absence and moved to Costa Rica for a year to get some, just a different life experience. Came back um, to Elmhurst and um, continued working there for a year. And then I relocated into the Harvard, Illinois area. 
Once I got to that area, I spent a year working at Lakeland School in Elkhorn, Wisconsin, and that's a school strictly for special education, um, pre-K through 21 at the time. I believe it's um, 22 now. And then in 2009, I took a teaching position in Harvard where I taught special education. Up until last school year, Harvard um, initiated an instructional coaching team, a team of six of us. And so that's where I spent my time last year. Um, our, our coaches in Harvard, don't, they don't get assigned to one building. So I had the opportunity to work in our pre-K building. We have a K-3 building, a 4-5 building, middle school, six through eight, and then our high school building. So um, if fortunate to see the wonderful teachers of Harvard and work with um, many, many um, experienced and talented colleagues. And then, as I mentioned earlier, I've also been working as a site coach for the Illinois Autism Project. That's been put on hold this summer due to um, the pandemic, of course. So I, I just thought we'd put a little cartoons in here and set the mood. Um, I thought this was kind of funny because we just keep kind of guessing what the future is going to look like. And, and we don't know what the upcoming year might hold for us, but we do know it's going to be different. It does sound like many districts are doing um, a hybrid type where it's going to be some distance learning and some in-person learning. Um, but I am, you know, as you watch the news and the, and the reports coming in, it looks like some are, are going all distance and some are going all live. But hopefully, whatever it looks like for you, today's presentation will leave you some ideas for planning and for implementation. I also added this just because I thought it was cute, but also super important to remember the impact that this has had and will continue to have on our students as well. Learning and school instruction has been changed not only for us as educators and or as parents, but also for our students. So no matter what the future of schooling looks like, we're gonna to need to continue to adjust. Today's objectives. It is my goal that each of you will walk away with at least three evidence-based practices that will positively impact and support our special education students. So the way I decided to organize it for the sake of today's webinar is are, are in the areas of structures and routine, social emotional learning and behavior reinforcement or behavior shaping and supporting and scaffolding instruction. I did pick the three visuals or I picked the visual at the bottom for those three areas because I think it's important to note that these areas do not stand alone and they're more often than not intertwined. We're going to start with structure and routine. Indivis individuals with autism spectrum disorder and other learning challenges, so again, I want to be clear that it's not only for our students on the autism spectrum, thrive in structured and well-organized work environments. I think that's going to be, as much as that's important live, I truly believe that's even more important in a virtual learning setting. So we're going to focus on two evidence-based practices in this area of structure and routine. Those are going to be visual supports and antecedent behavior intervention. There are tons of strategies that can be used to support these practices. You're going to find that these practices increase on-task behavior and work completion. They minimize disruptive behavior and they foster independence. So the first evidence-based practice we're going to cover together is visual supports. And you're gonna see evidence of this practice again and again and again throughout this presentation. So visual supports are just any tool presented visually that support that individual as he or she moves throughout their day. They might include pictures, just written words, could be objects, any type of visual boundary, schedules, labels, organizational um, systems, and scripts. So visual supports provide concrete cues about an activity, routine, or expectation. They can be low or high tech, and that's the same in live learning and in distance learning. They're often used in conjunction with other evidence-based practices like prompting, reinforcement, video modeling, and social narratives. We're gonna cover all of those today. And they organize the sequence of events, enhance students' ability to understand, anticipate, and participate in those events. So a structured schedule is the one, one of the most effective use of visual supports. When creating a structured schedule for your students, 
It's important to keep in mind that they should be visible, predictable, adaptable in the case of change, considerate of the student and his or her learning environment, so that schedule may be different if it's live versus distance learning, that it allows for some student choice when possible, and that it's deliberate, meaning you're thinking about the sequence in which you set the schedule. And when I, to, to hop back up to visual, when I say visual, think about like your planner as an adult and what you do to plan your day. Um, it should be there for the student. They should be able to access it whenever they need it. Simply telling the student what the schedule is, is not as effective. So on the left, you're gonna see some examples of a full day schedule. Now this obviously is an example of an elementary um, student, but we'll look at some and we'll talk about some um, examples of, for some of the older students as well. With this particular student, we were able to list at the bottom all the potential related services he may have and circle them just as they were about to happen. This allowed some flexibility in case the schedule may need to change, maybe because the related service member was sick or maybe they had an IEP meeting and we're gonna um, grab the student later. And that student was allowed, he was able to handle that. But if you look at his specials, you'll see that we listed what was first and what was second on that day. Our special schedule changed depending on the day of the week. So we learned to list them like this for this student because one particular day he became very upset at the end of the day when he realized he had art and music and not PE. He loves PE. That, that was a huge frustration and meltdown at the end of the day. So we learned from that. And when we talk about antecedent behaviors um, in, the, in the next few slides, that's one way that we learned from it. We saw that that was a trigger. He, he didn't know what to expect. And so we were able to adapt his visual schedule to meet his needs. Once we started visually showing him what to expect, it took away that behavior and that frustration. On the right is the schedule that he used once he was in the environment. So for the example that you see, it, you'll see on the left, it says 210 Miss White. Well, that Velcro strip and the pictures on it show the student the next four things he would be doing while in room 210. And it, if you look closely at number four at the bottom, you're going to see a choice card. That is a built-in time in his schedule where he's given a menu of things to choose from during this time. So, you know, you, you know your students and you'd figure out what that menu might look like. It, um, for this particular student, it could be sand, beanbag time, painting. Um, I've had kids pick math, different things depending on the student. But then you see right before at that number three is the bathroom. And this particular student, his least favorite thing was to go to the bathroom. So we had to deliber be deliberate about that. And so in order to get him to that choice time, he knew that he was gonna have to go and do the bathroom um, part of his schedule first. And that helped to kind of motivate him to get that, to that fourth piece. The other thing you might consider is you see that we color coded orange for this student. If you have multiple students using similar schedules, color coding can be helpful because it kind of like brings the student eye to their area, but it also helps the adults in the classroom as well. Go ahead. So this might look different depending on age, of course, and cognitive level of the student. With some of our middle school and high school students, we, we just use written words. And even like apps, um, you could use Google Calendar, you could use Google Docs. Um, no, her chair. Or they, and they could just access that through their schedule, maybe um, on their iPad, their phone, their Chromebook. There are also a lot of apps out there that you might consider, and I listed them on this slide for the participation slide. Some of the free ones that I've seen being used include at first the app, pocket schedule planner, and to-do list and calendar. So here's an example of a schedule that was used for distance learning at home. So this could have been email to the student or the parent, or if it was like a hybrid structure, um, you could just send it home with the student ahead of time. With some students, I've used specific times um, as to which time each activity is gonna start. But with others, I stay away from that depending on their level of rigidity. Um, again, I spent most of my time with elementary students, but this could be easily adapted for the higher grade levels. Depending on the student, you wouldn't need to use pictures. You could just use written words. But I will say, again, it's important to remember 
that the schedule must be visible and the student should have access to it at all times. Simply telling the student verbally have the same effect. And the other thing to consider is if you are fully remote, you could have um, the students and you create these schedules together or ask the parents for some help or maybe a paraprofessional as well, maybe during a Zoom meeting. Um, you could also um, have the schedule set up maybe on your tabs and maybe during morning meeting, you're going through each student's schedule and then going back and referring to it constantly throughout the day. So this next slide, I originally had towards the end of the presentation when we were looking at um, scaffolding and supports, but Lisa Westman's been an awesome resource for me. And um, after kind of talking back and forth with her, we decided to move it up just to make sure that we had time and that we didn't skip it. But it, it does sort of go along with the idea of um, setting that schedule for your students. So these are just some possible virtual schedule structures that you might consider. You could do whole group morning message, could be calendar time, um, class meetings to prepare for the day, whole group instruction, essential standards works. Um, and then you might consider having smaller group live sessions. So that could be social groups, literacy, math, maybe IEP goal work or standards-based grouping, collaboration time. Uh, maybe consider having, again, your paraprofessionals and related service providers help leading these as well so that you have time to work with your other students in one-to-one -one direct instruction. So one-to-one -one live sessions might be used to meet students' individual needs and increase engagement. Mm -hmm. You definitely wanna consider some independent work time as well. Um, that could be, you know, Google Classroom. It could be recorded lessons. It could be hands-on activities for the students to complete at home. Um, you're gonna see some examples of independent workstations. You could um, mirror those in the, in the home setting if you'd like. Different e-learning platforms, choice boards, et cetera. Also consider having some sensory movement break built into a virtual schedule. Anything from, you know, fine motor tasks. Our students love Go Noodle. Any singing and dancing, exercise, yoga, projects. And again, a movement choice board has been pretty popular. And then I, um, I'm str I strongly feel that there should be some built in re reward or reinforcement time where a student can choose the reward from maybe a reinforcement menu. You could do this both ways. You can have students earning reinforcement in addition, but I do think it's important to just have some of that already built into the schedule. So moving on to routine strips, this is another example of a um, visual support. And they're very similar to your visual schedule. They're used to provide support and build independence with those common routines. They can be used in conjunction with one another and they can be faded as students reach independence or mastery. So here is an example. On the left, you see an example of a different visual, visual schedule that we've used. This one actually has a built-in reinforcement, behavior reinforcement system for this student. Um, on the right, you see a routine strip. Uh, this student went to homeroom. You see on his schedule, he went to homeroom from 8.10 to 8.50 every morning. The routine strip then was used once he was in that setting so that he would remember what was um, expected of him during the time in Mrs. Meyer's class. Here are some of the more commonly used routine strips and I think that these are going to be huge um, and super important with the new COVID routines and procedures. So our students are gonna have to learn a lot of new routines and they're gonna be really important to master. So washing hands um, uh, six feet apart, any of those new procedures and routines that are gonna be taught to the student. Um, again, the goal is to fade prompts as the student becomes more successful. My favorite um, that, that we've used is the end of the day routine strip. So our students had a take home folder to complete as part of every day end of the day routine. And we noticed just having to use a lot of verbal prompts and the students needing a lot of help and, and um, reminders to stay on task. So we actually came up with this routine strip and we taped it inside those folders that they were asked to complete. Once we did that, the students could refer to them as they went about their tasks. We noticed a huge, huge, huge increase in independence and the students were able to complete these tasks at a much more rapid rate. 
um, they would even point to the pictures for each other and help each other out, which was pretty adorable. Here's a distance learning example. We just took a paint strip and stuck some Velcro on there. Um, this particular student liked to count backwards, so we modified it for that student, but you could obviously flip it and have the one at the beginning. You might send home pictures for the parents or the students to um, create on their own, or you could do it together during um, a live meeting. Um, and really, this could be used as a visual schedule or a routine strip. Either one of those would work. Here's a distance learning example for an older student, um, and obviously the student was a reader. So here was a junior high student who struggled to get online and get to the morning Zoom meetings each morning during distance learning. So this way um, they could follow the steps, move the check mark over as they completed the step, um, and then get ready for their day with less support. So I'm going to do a time check here and see how we're doing. I feel like I'm flying. We're doing great. So just some time to maybe reflect on, on one or both of the following questions. You could, you could just reflect on your own. You could type them in the chat box. You can share, or if you have any questions, we can do that now as well. We'll give about two minutes to think about those things. Hey, Megan, we do have a question that was chatted in. Sure. I think going back to some of the schedules that you were showing a little bit earlier, um, Rebecca asked, are those schedules vertical top down? So it depends on this. I've done it either way. So this is this the, probably what we were looking at here. This was a, a, you know, top down here. This was, you know, you start here. This was the morning meeting. And then these are the things that we would do during that morning meeting. So during morning meeting, we did these four things. Um, so just kind of depended on the student. I hope that answers the question. And then just some feedback here. I like the idea of posting the schedule for my junior high special ed resources for distance learning. Okay, so we're gonna keep on going here if that's okay with everybody. And we're going to look at our next uh, evidence-based practice, um, antecedent behavior intervention. So again, remember that these practices are really interconnected and can be used in a variety of ways. And we might need a little refresher again on that antecedent behavior intervention. When we're looking at antecedent behavior, we're really looking at what is happening right prior to the behavior or the student performance. So we might be looking at who is there. What does the environment look like? Was there a trigger? And so we're looking at those things so that we can take away any negative triggers and we can put in those triggers that lead to positive results. The goal of ABI is to identify conditions that are reinforcing interfering behaviors and then to modify that environment so that those conditions no longer elicit that interfering behavior. I'm a huge proponent of not only looking at those negative antecedents, but also the positive. If we see what is positively impacting students, it's my opinion then that we can identify those conditions and reinforce those outcomes to replicate those and then help the student be successful. I'll show you some ideas of that as well, some examples of that. So ABI, some of the things that it provides is structure, predictability, and consistency. ABI non-verbally communicates expectations and steps, promotes academic and behavioral success, and strengthens independence. Here are some common strategies. They include arranging the environment, changing the schedule or routine, structuring time, using highly preferred activities or items to increase the interest level, free activity interventions and offering choices. This is an example of arranging the environment and setting it up for reduced teacher prompts and increased time on task and work completion. On the left, you see that there's a, a blue box 
We were able to arrange this environment by providing that box as a reminder to the student that he needed his PEX book, his communication um, book. This was implemented after the student was triggered by sitting down to snack without his PEX book and then being asked, of course, to get up and get it because you need your communication device to ask for what you want for snack and would just trigger some um, negative behavior in the student and cause him frustration. So we changed the environment. We added that blue box as a visual reminder and taught the student to cite that box and know to grab his textbook. Um, once we added that, the student on its way to snack would see that blue box, immediately grab his textbook, and it took away that behavior. We've used similar strategies to this with other things such as like different communication devices or maybe students that need to remember their planner, um, their Chromebook, Chromebook, whatever it may be. And then once it works in the place that you've taught it, go ahead and mirror that in the other environments that the student um, goes to throughout the day. On the right, you see an example of arranging and structuring the environment for success. You see the visual one, two, three on the student desk to remind the student of the three tasks he, need, he or she needs to complete. And then those numbered boxes below um, show the student, you know, here's number one, there's number one. Here are some other examples of environmental structure and support. Again, we structured the environment to set students up for success. This is an actually, this is an independent workstation task. So the students were asked to complete this on, your own, on their own, which could be really helpful if you're doing part live, right? And the student has to work independently. So then you could go meet with your students who are um, at home virtually learning. So what we did here is we um, numbered and organized the tasks to increase independence and time on task. Some of the things we did um, in addition, so with one particular student, we would put like a little itty bitty half piece of a fruit snack in each bin as little motivators to finish along the way. We were eventually able to fade that reinforcement, um, that food reinforcement. And then we moved on to like a token board where he would earn a token each activity he completed and eventually fade all of that reinforcement. The picture on the right shows an adaptive version of the one on the left. Again, we had to restructure because um, one of our students was finding these deep, these deep bins here on the left. He would put his face in the bin and scream because he enjoyed the echo that it created. Um, of course, that wasn't the outcome that we were looking for. So instead of, you know, we of course tried the visuals and all of that thing, but instead of having that verbal battle and constantly reminding the student not to do that, we just changed the environment and we put them in those um, more shallow cardboard box covers. So that took away that reinforcing behavior. So a great uh, example of how to um, look at those antecedents. Um, for another student, uh, we were seeing that she was seeking a lot of movement during these workstation tasks. So she was walking around the room and then coming back and walking and that was taking a lot of time to finish. So and again, instead of having that reminder and prompting to stay in your area, finish your work, we built in a movement break during that, that center, that um, work task. So we took a laundry basket, we moved it to the floor several feet away. Once she finished a task, she had to walk it over to the laundry basket, drop it in the bin, and then come back and complete the work. So that was adding that movement break for her. This is something I would absolutely consider in implementing if students do some sort of a split hybrid um, live and distance learning um, during our um, following school year. So here at home, we changed the environment to prompt students to focus on the task or activity at hand. So you could color code the work areas based on the subject the student was working on and then match that to the schedule. So here the student, we just took construction paper and taped it along the side of the computer and then put a same color construction paper underneath the computer. So yellow was reading, purple was math, green could be reward time, whatever works for you. Um, I would absolutely, if you're doing hybrid, uh, set this up in the classroom and then mirror the system at home for consistency and structure. Um, with older kids, you could do it differently. You could just um, write, you know, you could just use written words you could even do different rooms of the house instead of different colors. Um, with some kids, you could use different motivators, maybe hero pictures, whatever, animal pictures, whatever they're interested in. Um, and then even consider maybe for, again, for the older kids, like a work room and a break room. 
This is another just example of um, how we use antecedent interventions. So priming is a, a, a big, um, very effective example. So priming is just that exposure to academic materials or tasks for instruction. It can be used also to warn students about a change in schedule, structure, or routine. It allows the students to become familiar with the material. It reduces that stress. It ensures that key concepts are understood um, and students know what's coming next. Some practical tips, you might want to provide an agenda or a potential list of questions to a student before class discussion, or you can explain the most um, important concepts prior to instruction. And another consideration, you may ask parents, um, paraprofessionals, related service members to help prime students before a lesson. These are some visual examples of behavior priming that we've used with students. So again, it's, this wasn't particularly used for academic instruction, but instead um, getting students ready for a change. You could use these after noticing that these things trigger a student, so you're seeing that antecedent, or just you just know your students and based on um, knowing knowledge of your students, you might just use it as a precaution. So we, you know, we've written and, and gotten some visuals ready for if we have substitute teachers, when field trips are coming, any sort of change in the environment. Um, this slide just gives some other examples in other ways you might use um, priming to benefit your students. So for the example of a new lunch routine, maybe the student had gotten used to a lunch routine and it had been changed. Try video modeling. So you could record a video of peers um, completing the new routine and then show that student the video prior to placing him or her in the setting. You could practice a skill in isolation. So um, bowling in PE class is always, is always a good one because there's a lot going on. There's a lot of pins, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of kids. So instead of just throwing the student into that environment, you could set up pins in the hallway or the classroom, practice that skill sequence and expectations one-on-one -on -one to the student prior. And then a, a pre-teaching example. So maybe you have a virtual whole group science lesson. You might consider emailing a short video clip and or vocabulary to a student prior to the whole group instruction. Um, or you could have questions pre-assigned and send them out early so that the students have some time to prepare before the class discussion. These are some helpful things to remember when using these evidence-based practices. Support should be age appropriate. They can be used less over time, but keep the support available for when the student needs them. So we try to teach the students to ask for, student, for, ask for those supports when they need them, or um, they'll know where to access them and they can then independently access their supports on their own. Remember that the more stressful a situation, the, there's going to be more need for those supports. And stressful situations don't mean the student has regressed. It just might mean it's just been a stressful day and they might just require more support compared to a different day, week, or month. There's gonna be some ups and downs with that. Uh, the goal is for independence, but also for students to be able to self-regulate during unexpected change. So in time, we've had students even um, learn that they can draw their own visual or write their own social narrative. Um, and, and kind of start to, to self-regulate and use supports on their own. How are we doing? Any questions? We're doing pretty good on time. So if it's okay with you guys, I'll keep on going. Um, our next area is social emotional supports and behavior reinforcement. We're gonna look at examples of cognitive behavior intervention Reinforcement and social narratives. You've seen examples of all of these in the earlier slides as well. Using these practices, we increase appropriate behaviors, promote positive social emotional skills, reduce anxiety, and develop healthy coping strategies. And this section um, goes really well with Lisa Westman's keynote. So in this area, the first evidence-based practice we're gonna look at is cognitive behavior intervention. These are strategies in which learners are taught to examine their thoughts and emotions, recognize when they're escalating, and then strategies to cope with these feelings or to change their thinking and their behavior. A lot of that stuff that Lisa touched on this morning. Again, like we mentioned throughout this presentation, these are often 
pre these practices are often used in conjunction with other practices, such as narratives, reinforcement, and visual supports. So here's an example. Um, with this particular visual, I used it to model to my students how I was feeling in different situations and areas throughout the day. So um, maybe my bike was stolen this morning, guys, and I would move my little piece to the sad. Or gosh, I love the way everybody's working right now. I'm feeling so calm. Just modeling different, my emotions that, that the students had an opportunity to see that. Um, the awesome paraprofessionals I worked with had their own cards as well, and they could model this alongside the student during the day. And then of course, once our students got the hang of it, they were given their own cards and we really relied on these to get a sense of how the student was feeling. How are you feeling? It's time for lunch. I'm feeling mad. Okay, let's take a break. It's not, we're not, we need to be calm to go to lunch, things like that. Here's another, this is a popular example. This is used in a lot of classrooms in our district um, of using cognitive behavior intervention. And again, it helps students recognize their emotions and learn appropriate coping strategies. So you see like the emotion thermometer on the left and then on the right are those different things that you student might choose to do to cope or calm down if they needed to. Um, let's see, for the older students, this might be a quick check-in or a quick entrance ticket. I worked with a, a high school teacher that made these optional. He just had them ready on his desk and students could fill them out when they chose to and just like leave it discreetly in a spot that he had reserved for them. Um, Lisa mentioned some apps as well or I'm sorry, she mentioned um, the book, Permission to Feel. There's an app that goes along with it called Mood Meter. And that would be um, really a, a cool thing to look into for older kids. If you forget the name of that, that's all in your participant slides as well. So one particular year we were really struggling and I think Amy Lombardo's on this webinar right now. She, she and I worked through this together we were really reflecting on that empathy piece um, again that Lisa touched on and how how are we teaching empathy to our students they're not developing the skill what can we do to help them understand and, and to, to build that that empathy piece so we created this and actually I had to recreate it mine are on loan right now to teachers in the district I wasn't able to retrieve them due, due to COVID but basically um, we use this to help students understand circumstances um, or choices and how they may impact our emotion. So if I was frustrated or sad or angry, I would just take off a piece of my heart and, and show that to students. Oh, my grandma's sick or I was running late to work today. And they got to start thinking about how those little things add up. Oh gosh, she's only got one piece of her heart left. What can we do? You know, oh wow, thank you guys for pushing in the chair for me. Put a piece of my heart back. And so they really started to catch on to that um, and it got to got them thinking about how our our actions um, impact our feelings and kind of looking at the perspective of others. Um, some students really caught on they got their own hearts and so that would be at their desk so they could show me what was going on with them during the day or they could show their friends what was going on with them during the day. Um, so one student in particular at this really, really um, he just really bought into this. So we created a traveling version so it could go with him to, you know, all those other places in the school as well. And we just, I just took a little lanyard and added some Velcro. So this is an example that we used for older students, the concept of the straw that broke the camel's back, just teaching students that sometimes we're carrying or other people are carrying more than a comfortable load and just practice communicating how much straw we're carrying at the moment and, and, um, and what our feelings are and, and, and what's going on with us. Oops. Just some more examples of using visual supports to help teach students how to recognize um, and monitor emotions so that on the left is just like a slide. The student could kind of just slide up and down. Um, in the upper right, that was a clip we used if a student was needing a coping strategy or needed to calm down, he or she could choose from a menu of items and um, use that strategy to cope. And then at the bottom, I'm a huge proponent, especially at the elementary levels of having some sort of a calm down area in the classrooms, whether it be special ed, general ed, 
um, a related service room, music room, PE. I just think it's nice. It doesn't have to be elaborate, but like a place where students know they can go and be safe in their emotions. And so this is just an example of a visual we used in a first grade classroom, showing the students their options for calming down and then the expectations not to disrupt. Another example, um, using visual supports in combination with cognitive behavior intervention. This was used with um, a fifth, no, a fourth and fifth grade student. Um, and this example reminds me of what Lisa was talking about with like shaming and, you know, we're sending kids to the office and is that really helping? We really need to be teaching them how, how to handle those emotions so that they can handle them in any situation. So we used this in a general education class. Um, this student was just learning to stay in the classroom when upset rather than always having to go to the special education room or to the office. And so he, could, he or she could just pull this out um, and, and it allowed them to stay in the room and not miss instruction. We're gonna move on to reinforcement. Um, I am such a huge proponent of positive reinforcement and, and you'll see when you're, you're kind of looking most of, most of the research will show that it's, the ratio should be four to one praise to criticism. Um, but I just strongly feel that it should be even more than that, especially with our special learners. So a lot of the supports and strategies that we've already covered can be helpful in reinforcing positive behavior, but we'll show you some other ideas as well. This is super popular in the Harvard School District, especially at the pre-K and elementary building. Um, these are really easy to implement and extremely effective. It works just like a token board. So as the students, you know, completing work or making good choices or handing in assignments, whatever it may be, whatever your expectation is that you've taught the student, they earn that thumbs up. And when they earn five, could be three, could be 10, could be 20, whatever, they earn a um, choice time. Um, with some students, you could um, consider having a choice board like you see on the right. So those are all the, I, the, all the options the student can choose from during that time. Again, this reminds me going back to Lisa's keynote as well. Um, there, this is an example of a whole class reinforcement system. And then on the right, you see a student reflection page with data collection. And this went home each day. The student could then make goals for themselves of what they were going to earn. But I, I want to be, a, well, let me back up a little bit. In the next slide, you're going to see some ideas for when positive reinforcement is just not enough. But in this particular case, if the students earned yellows or reds, those went behind their name so that they were not displayed for everyone to see. Um, we also found it really beneficial for students to put up their own tokens so that they were really understanding that this was not given to them, this was earned by them and it helped them take ownership of that behavior and their choices. And then on the lower right side of the, or I'm sorry, yeah, the lower right side of the packet chart, it, it's probably hard to see, but it's a visual reminder of what types of behaviors earn those greens, those yellows and the reds. Um, so that students really weren't being shamed. It was more of that taking ownership of their behavior. Our older students do a similar system using points. And then I know, I think I saw Ashley on here, our uh, high school teacher, she does a fantastic job. She has a reflection sheet at the end of each subject um, where the students have a point sheet and a reflection exit ticket that they fill out throughout the day. So I'm not naive. I've spent enough years in the classroom to know that sometimes even when you provide all the positive support, have the best intentions, our teaching empathy, looking at the antecedents, arranging the environment, we're still gonna have instances where consequence is necessary. However, in these cases, I go back to the not shaming of the student. And I think, I, I, I believe it's super important to make sure these, these are clear to the student. So they need to know what behavior is going to be, there's gonna be a consequence for, they need some sort of a warning system to know it's coming and they need to know what's going to happen once once they earn that consequence. So these are just some ideas that that we have used just as a student is portraying that those negative, you know, maybe whatever it may be, they're earning an X. Three X is equal than a timeout. Um, it could be it wouldn't need to be a timeout. It could be anything that you decide. 
And I, I would imagine some of you have had students that no matter what uh, you've tried, engagement strategies, positive reinforcement, they're constantly talking about video games or whatever else, whatever it may be. So we used this just instead of having that verbal reminder of a student, don't talk about video games and, and taking away from all of that instruction. We just had this visual and each time the student talked about a video game, we made that X without having to, to stop instruction or be distracted. So moving on then to another evidence-based practice, and you've seen again some examples of this are social narratives. It's important to remember, you may think, oh, this are just for students with autism. And although they are super popular among the autism population, they are so effective for students with other diagnoses, including high anxiety, oppositional defiant disorder, ADHD, et cetera. So social narratives can be used to teach social skills and promote effective and, effective and appropriate communication in combination with visual supports and reinforcement and as a regular part of the day or a prompt before a specific situation. Here's an example of using a social narrative with cognitive behavior interventions. You could read this at the start of each day or have it handy during times of distress. Maybe you would have it in the calm down area. Again, Lisa Westman mentioned um, the book Permission to Feel and you could look at that mood meter map as well with this. This is an example of a social narrative used in a gen ed class. For older students, you might just have a notebook with the written social narratives. Um, some of our students, we even make a binder and we organize it so that they can access it when necessary. Some of them, uh, they just love reading them each day and they will choose to read their social narratives during calm time or recreation time. You could also consider sending them home with the parents. This is an example of one that was reviewed each and every time an occurrence that, that this occurred, which was every day the student earned elevator time. Um, but he just really needed that to remind him that I, I, he would get so excited. He needed that reminder not to run on the elevator and, and how many times he got to go and, and those kinds of things. You'll see that a lot of my social narratives and, and visuals look the same. I, I'm kind of old school. I still use the board maker um, original version because I have so many of them saved, but you can make a social story with just about any program. This is an example of a whole group social narrative we used as a class just to kind of limit that time on technology. They were constantly um, asking for technology during choice time and we, we wanted to kind of maybe reduce that. So instead of having a bit battle with the students each time they wanted technology, they, they knew the expectations were clear. So as reflection, sorry, I went a little fast here, but I am looking at time and I, we could kind of check in and see if there's any questions at this point. Um, and while we're doing that, reflect what you might consider trying for next year. Uh, we have, we're doing pretty good. I have one more area to cover and it's the shortest. So are there any questions at this time? Hey, Megan, this is Dan. Uh, no questions, just some, just some positive feedback here. The, the camel example is awesome. Um, personal connections when modeling feelings is a great way to help students and self-regulate. Uh, love your ideas. Uh, and just a, a quick housekeeping item. We are going to try and have the sessions wrapped up by 5-2. Uh, just so there's enough time between bells, if you will, to get from one class to the next uh, so people can move on to, to the next session. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to kind of pick my favorite slides for this, this next little piece. But like I said, it's the shortest um, part. Um, so we're going to look at supporting and scaffolding instruction. And we're just going to look at two strategies here, modeling and scripting. So we've seen some, again, ideas of modeling where the teacher um, or maybe a peer demonstrates a targeted behavior and the learner imitates that with positive reinforcement. Again, I think of Lisa Westman's idea of the cake and really visually showing the student what the final outcome could be. So I, I, I kind of think of modeling a success criteria as well. Some things to consider is to fade the prompts, break the behavior into steps, and um, demonstrate with incorporated pauses. 
here's an example. So if you're asking a student to write a sentence, what does that mean? What does that look like? So I would model it. I say my sentence out loud. I draw a line for each word of my sentence. Then I go back and I write the word in the lines. So again, using visual supports while modeling, you could break this up and do it together with the student. This is the same idea as the last slide, but used for older students. So this was to write a three paragraph essay. Again, the teacher provides a visual finished product, and then we box it up, title, paragraph, indentation, sentences. So the student has an idea of what it looks like. Of course, live teaching um, and video modeling also, our high school transition and life skills program, they are amazing. And our teachers sent out video after video to students um, of washing dishes, cooking breakfast, cleaning the bathroom, et cetera. So the student could watch it, they could mirror it, and then send their video back to their teachers. Another example, just doing live math instruction. I am a proponent in, in certain situations of errorless learning, so having the opportunity to practice it correctly. And then the last example or, or the strategy that we're going to look at is scripting. And again, in some of some of your settings, it's going to look a lot like sentence stems or frames. Here's an example we used in a first grade general education class. It's also a way to differentiate for students. This example we used for the lines of communication strategy, and we used a picture bank instead of a word bank. And then this was an example of scripting and modeling in um, Flipgrid. So this, these are great for synchronous and asynchronous learning. I think that's important to note. So this is a junior high life skills teacher we are working with. You see she's also using visual strategies by having that picture of roots. But she um, actually added me as a student to her class. So she could provide the script and the sentence stems. And then I could provide the model as to how, I, how that's going to look when I um, record my video. Another example um, of visual supports, and I love this one because we were able to fade it. So it, the student started with five warnings and three asks. Um, he had a hard time focusing on his work. So this helped him do that. You see there was a data sheet so he could help take um, data collection on that and set goals for himself. Um, once he got better, we would maybe instead of having five, he would have three focus warnings. Um, this was mirrored in his general education class as well. and. Um, he, he, it faded completely eventually. And I am gonna stop us there. These are just examples um, of those workstations, but they can also be incorporated into your instruction. So, um, that's pretty self-explanatory. And I just wanna say thank you so much for being here. I know that that was a lot and I kind of flew through, but I wanted to make sure we covered everything. If you don't mind and you have some time later, if you could provide some feedback on today, I would really appreciate it. And again, um, feel free to email me with any questions. Hey, Megan, just one last question here. Um, there was some positive feedback from the, uh, the token board idea. And um, this individual was asking uh, if you a copy of the high school reflection, reflection sheet version that you mentioned. Um, I do not you know, have a copy, but I could absolutely get one. So if that particular person um, would email me, and I would be sure to get that to you. Very good. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your time this afternoon. And thank you, uh, Megan, so much. Um, phenomenal presentation. Really um, some just some great information here. Thank you all for being here. Have a great day.